My name is Elazar Leibovic. Uh, I've been programming for too many years, and lately I've been in um, meddling in all things <coughs> embedded and, and interaction, hardware, software interaction. And the reason I'm here today is that in my, uh, my first task in where I work today was uh, <coughs> to print out the page table. The page table of our hardware, hardware device we have. I had to print it, and in order to print it nowadays, the, the best way to display it is to uh, uh, provide it as a JSON. Uh, <coughs> and the way to do that was the following. It's a uh, library that produced JSON with a printf-like syntax, and I didn't like that. Um, I didn't like that because, um, for example, you have to repeat the mapping of each field of the struct you're trying to serialize to make JSON of in every occurrence, every time you, uh, you parse it. I didn't like it because um, you have asymmetry. You have one place where you explain how to make this track a JSON and a different place where you explain how to make a JSON, um, a JSON a struct. And so I had to think over, to think over how do we make that for C++, how, how can we improve on that? And before I'm starting to think of how to do that, I want to understand why I want to do that. Uh, I want to make sure I'm not solving an other take case that wouldn't matter for anyone. So I was thinking uh, what kind of applications serialize, use serialization. And I noticed that a lot of that actually every big project I've worked it, uh, I've, I've worked at uh, in the past uses some form of serialization. Uh, it took a C or C++ struct and made it into an array of bytes which are usable for other parts of the, simple, of the system to consume, and vice versa. Every project, uh, and you can see that the Ninja, Ninja is a build system that if you used CMake recently, you probably uh, used it because CMake, more than CMake, produces Ninja files, and it's the equivalent of the modern equivalent of Make files. And it apparently has some form of serialization, even though it hardly has any user uh, visible input and it's usually behind the curtain. Uh, you can see a struct which is actually dis deserialized from the command line argument. Silang, um, the compiler, also has a form of serialization and deserialization for the compiler commands. Uh, this is a database it produces. And I think originally it wasn't the serial, but eventually it was. Uh, a database of how each file is compiled. It's a C++ class, but the compiler converts it to and from JSON. It's not a web application, uh, but it still uses serialization. The Linux kernel has a lot of serialization, even though it's a kernel and uh, the, 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 the user space interaction is usually through, through fake files. Um, but it still has interaction. This is an example from um, some networking um, protocol it has in line and it uses it to serial this class to the network and vice versa. And then use the class internally to um, change the network behavior. Uh, and even projects like Uboot, Uboot is a very, very popular bootloader. It's a bootloader, no one interacts with it. You usually don't know, you don't even know it's there. But it has serialization. It takes some uh, boot loading command and converts it to structs. Uh, so I really think every project, every big project has an, a need for serialization and you'd better get that right. You'd better make developers <coughs> convenient with serializing and deserializing. The more convenient it would be for them to serialize things, the more things that <coughs> the more they'll do that and the more visibility you'll have on your system. So I really think every project needs serialization. 
Now, after we're done with the why, we need to figure out the what. What exactly are we trying to achieve? Every approach has trade-offs, and we need to find out what's important for us and try to solve uh, to an adequate solution. So I can only uh, say what, what was important for me. Uh, I was a new guy in a new company. I didn't want to shatter everything. I didn't want to make big changes. I want to fit in. I want to blend in. So uh, I wanted to be able to use existing classes. I didn't want to force all classes that should be serializable to, for example, to inherit from some serializable class. I didn't want those classes to be generated from IDL files. I wanted that users would be able to take existing classes as existing instructs and be able to serialize and deserialize them. Um, a project like Serda PP uh, would not help me in this regard. It requires changes to every new struct you're, you're serializing. Um, another thing <coughs> I, w it, I, wa I wanted to have the, fl the flexibility in the output format. I didn't want to introduce a new, uh, a new uh, serialization format. If everyone uses JSON, I didn't want to introduce YAML or TOML or uh, there are many, many serialization formats. Uh, I didn't even want to introduce a new library. I didn't want to take a serialization library that forces you to use rapid JSON and not the, the, the JSON library we're using right now. I wanted, to, uh, I wanted this flexibility. I wanted minimal impact on the system. Uh, and yeah, for, and for example, moving to protocol buffers is a big change if you don't have that in the system. And the last thing that was important for me, I'm not sure if it's really important, but because it, some bugs from this problem uh, beat me, I want to make sure we w wouldn't have any m more of those. Um, is asymmetry between serialization and deserialization. And uh, if you have to specify, like in Boost Archive, the serialization, and then specify the deserialization, you can have a problematic case where you serialize something, deserialize it, and lose information. And I don't think that every opportunity for bug is bad because bugs can happen for multiple reasons, but this type of bug is a very subtle bug that could be hard to find uh, because you, could, uh, you, you don't have a clear indication that, this, that, that the deserialization didn't work out, and you only um, be able to see the impact very much later, so it's hard to catch it. Um, so I wanted that we would, be, we would specify the mapping between the JSON fields uh, to the struct fields once and be able to, uh, to get serialization and deserialization from this single specification. So <coughs> uh, that were the design goals. So we figured out the why. We figured out that every big project need serialization, deserialization. We set design goals, we figure out the what, and now we want to see the how. Um, so there are two general approach for serialization. Uh, one involves code generation, like in protocol buffers, where uh, you would generate the code that takes field from the serialized structure and put it uh, in the matching field in your struct. Um, and this is, it, it writes a code that you would manually write. Um, we can see uh, a simple class with field one and field two. And we would somewhat generate code that initializes the class or, and, 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 and puts, uh, process the data uh, to, to create a type from, for field one, type T1 for field one, and assign. Assign the first field and assign the second field. Uh, one approach would be to generate such a code. <coughs> and, and the other approach, which is uh, common in Java or Go, is to use reflection data, which, is, which you usually get for free, because the runtime gives that to you, and to uh, understand which fields uh, 
the mapping between fields and data from the reflection data. Um, we currently do not have reflection in C++. Uh, and in C++, you usually uh, try to pick the faster solution. And obviously, uh, code generation is faster in this regard. So I tried to find a um, solution that involves code generation and not uh, reflection that is consulted at runtime. So we decided on code generation, and there are two approaches, again, for code generation. It could be either internal. You could take a C++ construct and generate the serialization and deserialization code from this C++ construct with your compiler. And it could be external. You could run some script that would read the information from the struct and uh, and, 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 and generate real C++, new C++ code that does um, uh, the serialization and deserialization. Uh, so we tried uh, both of these approaches. And again, as we said earlier, everything is, involves trade-offs. There's no one good solution. And it's a good idea to try and figure out what's your trade-off before you start solving. Uh, so the, the <coughs> for me, the biggest advantage of internal uh, code generation, of using C++ construct to generate the code you want, is that uh, you <coughs> it's seamless. It works with the existing solution. You do not need to change anything in your build system. Um, you do not have to uh, uh, explain your developer where these files this, uh, come from. Um, you edit the file like you uh, usually edit them. Your IDE usually figures out uh, at least uh, a lot of the stuff. Clang they didn't always understand uh, complex template code, at least for me. Uh, but, uh, but it's still better than, than editing code that edits code. Uh, but the downsides are after you write the code, when you try to debug the code. When you have problems, when you have problems, you have very, very weird stack traces of uh, 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 um, uh, which is a true story. Uh, we generate the code with the Silang, and Silang generated crazy uh, symbol name, and GDB crashed because it couldn't parse the long uh, symbol name with all the templates. Um, so uh, it creates fiction. Uh, we had to use uh, LLDB. Uh, and uh, it's, hard, it's hard to read the stack trace. Um, to generate good code, you need modern C++. You're not flexible in, in the C++ version you're using. Uh, and the advantages of the external ap approach are the disadvantages of the internal ap approach. Uh, it offers you either debugging, because when you, having, you, when you crash, you can see exactly the code uh, that crashed. When you want to set up uh, a breakpoint, you have a file in a line. If you're using templates, a file in a line doesn't mean a lot. It could stop on a lot of, uh, it could uh, be generated, uh, the, a single template line could generate a lot of functions. Uh, so it's harder to uh, set a breakpoint. But uh, you pay with more complicated build system. Uh, <coughs> So I'll start with the uh, internal approach. What we did, um, we relied on two ingredients. Um, the first one is fixed string, fixed string or the proposal. And the essence of this proposal is a way to give a string literal as a template parameter. And we need that because templates would generate the mapping, and the mapping involves a field name in JSON. So that's a, a and the code is essentially this, the code for fixed stream. Uh, this proposal wasn't accepted, but it's not a, a big hurdle to add this piece of code to your code base. Um, and I wouldn't explain the interesting technique of the fixed string, but the essence is uh, having a string literal as um, a template parameter. Uh, 
And the mechanism that would eventually allow you to take a single mapping of a struct to JSON and generate both serialization and deserialization code for it is a variadic template. Uh, and we would first see how do we thrill that thing, how do, you, how do you generate both serialization and deserialization code for a single field? Um, so we would have a class that accepts a fixed, fixed string, which is the field name in JSON, and would accept a field pointer. And this class would have two functions that, uh, uh, that implement the serialization and deserialization according to the JSON field and uh, to the function pointer. Note that this is just an example. You can use a, a, a different class that has another method uh, that it doesn't just assign the field with a field pointer, but it, for example, use a function on the class and, and, and the piece of JSON and, uh, uh, and do some more logic uh, <coughs> on the JSON data. Uh, but uh, we would have a class that would generate two functions that serialize and deserialize uh, the single field. Um, now we would use variadic template that would take a lot of fields and would generate code uh, and would just uh, use all the classes we gave, uh, we gave it to generate civilization code for each and every field. This is more or less uh, the real code that that, that, that 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 we accept a lot of uh, we accept the t is the class we want to serialize to, and we accept a lot of field serializer and deserializer, and 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 and, and the two JSON serialization function would just apply all this field serialization. The deserialization function would apply all the field deserialization. And we're essentially done. The record is not, not too far from this piece of code you're seeing here. Uh, and this is an example of, of how you use the code. Um, you, d you define a new class with all the relevant fields. Uh, and you would later use the, this class. Uh, <coughs> you would use the two methods of the class uh, to serialize and deserialize. So, so far, <coughs> we've seen why we want to serialize. Uh, we've seen the design goals of a very flexible serialization format. And we've seen uh, uh, two techniques to generate this code, except uh, fixed string as a template argument to know uh, how, from which, which field to get, uh, uh, from which JSON field to get uh, the, the data I want from, for serialization, uh, generate serialization and deserialization uh, function for a single field, and use a variadic template uh, that would accept all your fields and generate and, and would serialize and deserialize all your fields to, um, <coughs> to serialize the entire struct. And as we said, it, everything is defined uh, Externally, you don't have to change. You can use that even for structs in, in the Linux kernel headers. Uh, you can define that in a different place than the struct itself is defined. Um, so uh, now I want to present the second approach, external approach. We want external tool to read uh, uh, the struct, the abstract syntax tree of the struct, and to generate serialization and deserialization code. And I was asking myself which reliable tool can read the, <coughs> the C or C++ class. And I actually need a tool to parse C++, and parsing C++ is not an easy task. And I've seen tools, uh, I've seen libraries that use libclang to parse your uh, code, but I 
I had problems with this approach because um, having a libcilang as a dependency uh, is 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 it's quite a hard deal because you have the libcilang dependency to match your own compiler, uh, and uh, it's a lot of work to build this the, the libcilang. Um, but we have another tool, which is av which is available for everyone and, and can help us pass the the. C++ code we're compiling, and we always know it would be able to compile our C++ code because we use that to, to generate the binary, then the, and this tool is Silang, because apparently Silang is able to generate JSON file, which represents the abstract syntax tree of your code, and you can use your existing um, make file and just generate for selected files the abstract syntax tree in JSON, and then use external tools to read this JSON, uh, read all the fields of the structs you're interested in, in and generate a serialization and deserialization code. Um, note that uh, because um, CN, uh, it, it, it can even pass comments, and you can use comments as de facto annotations to add information about how you want to um, serialize and deserialize every field. This is how a, a single struct with single int field look. This is AST. Um, so it's hard to handle that. So I just want to um, uh, show you the, some of the relevant fields. Um, you have to look for CX6 record decal, which is a declaration for uh, structs. Uh, and inside, you can find field decal, which is a declaration of field in a struct. You can ignore most of the other thing and still get uh, uh, a listing of the structs and, uh, uh, and, and the fields to be able to generate code from. Um, as I mentioned, you have, uh, again, if you, all, you, all you need to eventually take is the text comment, and you can have comments about fields and about structs uh, to get some, uh, 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 if you want to, cu to customize the way you serialize and deserialize this field. You can use. Uh, there are a lot of tricks you can use, but one trick that uh, I used is uh, empty struct template uh, specialization, which can uh, give you uh, uh, external information. As I said earlier, I don't always want to change the code that, uh, of the struct itself, so I can use uh, an empty struct with variadic templates uh, and template specialization and, and explicit template specialization to specify in a different file, how do I want this specific struct to be serialized and deserialized? I don't have to change the struct itself. Uh, one thing to note is that uh, the Clang AST uh, contains ID, which are actually cross-references. Uh, so for example, when you would look at the abstract syntax tree of the template specialization, specialization uh, you would need uh, to look for the ID of the field that was previous men previously mentioned uh, if you have a, a, a field uh, pointer. Yeah. This is the, the reference for the field, and this is the field itself, the same ID. So that, that's the way it's done in um, CPAS. Um, and I was surprised to find out that uh, there's actually a Rust library that is specific to uh, use Clang AST JSON output, and it actually is able to one of one of its features is, is that it automatically filters to only the pieces that are of interest for you. So it was useful to generate C C++ code for serialization and deserialization. One final note is that. Uh, uh, Two proposals that could help in the more far future is the reflection and also meta classes. It could help generate serialization and deserialization code. Um, 
So I think the most important thing is that you have to decide on a serialization strategy. Um, once you've done that, once you make sure that serializing and deserializing strategy is convenient, uh, you could, uh, it could be of great benefit to your project. Um, you can use templates to generate serialization and deserialization in code, and you should consider Clang AST output if you want to uh, use external tool to generate C++ code. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Explain that enough, but, but I, I don't have to care about the padding data or about how C++ does thing, because I'm generating explicitly the code that tells C++ to take this field of the struct and assign data to it. Um, I'm not I'm not sure I understand the question, but if you're asking uh, if the uh, a DCL struct has to be 100% binary equivalent to the original struct, so uh, the answer is, is probably no, but, uh, uh, but this is a C++ issue. This is not an issue of uh, generating code that serves and deserves the struct. Uh, and there are, does that answer the, your question? Okay, I, th I think we'll take it offline. Yes, please. How is your call going to with different versions of the same structure or the same class. With time, classes tend to evolve. You have newer fields in the later versions or modified fields or fields which are removed. You know, and you might have a situation in which the serialization has one set of fields for that class and the serialization might have another set which only partially are uh, identical. And there might be fields in one side which doesn't exist on the other. The same on the other okay, so, so uh, the question was, uh, how do we deal with backwards compatibility uh, for serialization and deserialization? Uh, so uh, uh, the solution is not a direct solution for, uh, for this pro problem, but I think that this, this solution leads itself to how protocol buffer solves this problem. And it, uh, you don't rem and as long as you don't remove fields, you're just adding fields. Um, new code would be able to deal with uh, with older code um, um, because it would always uh, be able to partially serialize it, and you'll and and you'll need to be uh, to do the upgrade yourself. You you you'll need to. Uh, um, um, manage the versions and manage the upgrade from older version to newer version uh, yourself. This solution is just a solution giving a field and a, a mapping how to generate serialization and deserialization code for this specific uh, struct and for this specific version. Um, it, it, it does not have explicit solution for uh, 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 serialization versioning. Uh, though you can add such a solution for uh, this technique. Yes, please. Um, I wonder, did you uh, have any special uh, treatment for uh, things like uh, containers, such as vectors or maps, etc.? Uh, so, for example, in our specific approach, the, the library we've had is uh, nLochman JSON, and this library handles uh, vectors for us, and the code, the, actually the same code that I showed would handle vectors. Because the assignment would automatically use, uh, uh, convert the, uh, 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 the JSON uh, array to vector, and, 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 and assuming your type is correct, uh, uh, it would assign uh, correctly. Uh, so again, it, uh, uh, th 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 there's no direct uh, treatment of arrays, but you could use, the, uh, you could use a different field uh, serialization, ser ser serializer to the varags and make sure it handles array if you know this field has array. Uh, 
and you need special treatments for RA. Uh, uh, last okay, question. We eventually uh, uh, use the internal approach of variadic templates. Uh, and this is just, in my, uh, from my perspective, uh, uh, you know, it's like the story of a short, long way or a long, short way. Uh, uh, it's easier to, uh, uh, to write the code, but it's harder later when you debug it. Uh, I, I would rather have uh, external code, which is very explicit, but we eventually choose a variadic, variadic template approach. Um, so so th th this question has uh, actually two parts. Uh, there's no essential problem with using a setter instead of assignment, because uh, as we said, uh, I wrote uh, uh, one class that uh, serializes by assignment. We could use a different class that serializes by uh, applying uh, a setter and a getter. Uh, I think you have a good. Uh, I think you have a good point uh, uh, with class that do, that that are immutable that wouldn't let you modify their fields, and the approach I would use and and I think uh, is is generally used when building such immutable classes is to use a builder class that would uh, uh, that you would generate the class uh, from that and 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 this relates to the builder class and then initial the immutable class with the builder class. Uh, because uh, this is a real problem. If you have, uh, uh, you have to somehow, even if you didn't use special code to ser for serialization, you had to somehow collect uh, all the fields to a builder class and build it, build the immutable class at once. Uh, yes, please. Um, yeah, no. So the two comments. One is uh, loop serialization. I think you mentioned that you just started that because it, of concern of divergence between the writer and the mm -hmm. reader function. But loop serialization has a serialized function. Both in one, so you don't get that divergence. Okay, I looked into um, it, but probably didn't look enough. So, so the, the, the second comment is by depending on the claim AST, um, one of the trade offs that you're taking is that your code is fundamentally not portable because the claim AST is subject to change over time. So you might upgrade the claim compiler, and now all your code is broken. So mm -hmm. I just was wondering if you had any thoughts on that aspect of it. Uh, okay, the, the question. Uh, the, 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 the question is how stable uh, the client AST tree is. So uh, mm, my feeling was when, uh, when looking at the tree over time is that uh, although it's not stable, the basic parts of just listing the fields of a struct are stable enough. I might be wrong with that. And if you have uh, any input, I'll, I'll be happy to hear that. But my, uh, uh, my impression is that it, it's not stable overall, but uh, there are uh, subparts which are stable enough. Uh, 